Our talk today is, is vegan enough <laughs> to ensure good health? And I'm just going to tell you in one word, no. <laughs> it's not. And um, you know, you may know some vegans that are not so healthy. And they're not so, you know, just even, you can just tell a lot by looking that they're not. And a lot of vegans, even friends of ours, have experienced a lot of the same kind of health problems that traditional eaters do. So it's not only about food, although food is foundational. And today we're going to talk a little bit about food, but we're also going to talk about some other really important lifestyle um, habits that we all need to really invite, in, embrace, and invite into our lives because it. it there's a, you know, it's like a big puzzle with a lot of parts, and it's not complete unless you have them all. Some of them are bigger, and you can get a pretty good picture of what, you know, what that puzzle is supposed to look like, but without all of it, it's incomplete. And so we're going to talk about a lot of different things that we think are really important, um, and we know when those things are missing from our lives that they impact our health. And um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get started a little bit just telling you about myself and then my husband Dan. You were telling them about what you handed them and you guys... Oh, I was it. and I got... <laughs> not surprising. Okay, keep her on. <laughs> Point it in the right direction. That's right. So um, you go ahead and tell them about that then. So you got the, this pamphlet which you talked about. And then we just announced uh, some of our classes are available online. So we're, our Fundamentals of Raw Living Food, which is our, our premier class that we've been offering for 18 years. It's now available online. We also have the first of our nutritional science classes uh, available online. So, so the best place is to come to our school in Fort Bragg. And the second best place is go online and do it now. And there's no waiting. So, um, and we're also, it's uh, $50 off right at the moment. So it's even a good buy. Does it say that on there? Because I've been telling people that. It doesn't, but okay. it is. All right for at least through this weekend and probably for the beginning of the week and it might change after that. But okay. right now you can save some extra money. Okay. And of course, the raffle ticket. Everybody get their raffle ticket. Oh, you can no. enter again to win a beautiful nine tray Excalibur dehydrator that we're giving away. And it's a it's a cherry red stainless steel dehydrator. It's not the plastic one, the black plastic one. Um, it's still the same great quality Excalibur. We really believe in Excalibur. It's my favorite brand. I've been using it for 20 years. Um, and they're, they've generously donated it for us to give a gift to a lucky winner. So we're going to be giving it away at 3 o'clock at the Living Light booth, which is, of course, with all the other vendors, but we're up against the far wall just before you go into the restrooms. We're right there on the corner. So we'll be giving it away at 3 o'clock. If you win, you can take it home with you. And if you win and you're not there, then you will have to pay for shipping for us to ship it to you. And we're located in Fort Bragg on the Mendocino Coast. That's where our school is. And so it would, you know, for most of you, probably it would be a short um, and not very expensive. Uh, I'll bet it's kind of a heavy or you machine. Could, or you could drive up and pick it up. But it's easier to just come to our booth at 3 o'clock when you win and pick it up. <laughs> now, if you come in late, sorry. Um, they're right here. And if you come in late, we have some literature on that back uh, little table right there. You're welcome to pick that up. And then um, Dan's going to go around and give you, raise your hand if you didn't get a raffle ticket. <clears throat> okay. So, um, so I'm going to uh, go ahead and get started and just tell you a little bit about about myself and then Dan will and then we'll get into what we're going to talk about today which is the question is vegan enough to ensure good health <clears throat> so my name is Sherry Soria and I'm the founder and director of Living Light Culinary Institute uh, which I started 18 years ago um, I created the genre I guess the cuisine that people know of as raw vegan and people have come to our school, Living Light Culinary Institute, from over 60 countries. And when we've done world tours, we found that we have graduates all over who are spreading this information about the benefits of the raw vegan diet um, in their countries. And uh, many of them are now going to be, are interested at least, in opening up Living Light Centers in their area. And that's what we're doing next, is we are empowering people who want to open up their own culinary, raw culinary schools. Um, as I mentioned before, Dan and I, even though we eat a primarily raw vegan diet, we're not 100% 
100% raw all the time. We do eat some well-chosen cooked food, so we're going to talk a little bit about that today as well. And, um, <clears throat> And so I've actually been teaching um, vegetarian, vegan, and raw culinary arts for over 40 years. I'm 68, and um, even though you know I may not look 68, a lot of people think you know I'm younger. I certainly feel younger, and I can tell you that I had no idea when I was in my 20s or 30s that I would look or feel so great at this age. I thought this was kind of old. <laughs> and I don't feel old at all. Um, but anyway, so I'm, I'm fortunate that I got started at a pretty early age um, getting off of meat and animal products and I am very different from the rest of my family. A lot of people think, well, she probably just has good genes. But I'll tell you what I don't. Um, the majority of my family members have cancer, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, almost all of them are obese. Um, my sister recently uh, lost 100 pounds when she finally embraced the raw food diet, realizing that I might be onto something. Um, she's eight years younger than me and people were starting to think she was my, my mother. So they, she decided to make some changes. Um, so I became interested in, in raw food at a young age because my mother died when I was only four. Um, my grandfather died when he was in his early 50s. Never knew my grandmother. She died before I was born. And um, uh, people in my family were just, you know, really, I hate to say, but kind of, you know, just dropping. <laughs> and it was really scary. It scared me. And so I started reading about health when I was in high school. And by the time I was in my 20s, I, I had taken uh, all the animal products out of my diet and started really focusing on, on my health because I wanted to make sure that what was happening to other members of my family didn't happen to me. Um, and I won my first cooking contest when I was 12 years old, so uh, as I started to change the way I ate I, and I was making food for other people, they wanted to learn how to make this great tasting food that made them feel good, so I started teaching uh, vegetarian cooking in my, in my early 20s. And, um, and I've never looked back. It's been a wonderful journey. Uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about today is how important it is for you to, or for all of us, to do something with their life that makes them feel uh, that they're valuable, that they're doing something that, you know, living their passion, that they're not just, you know, picking a job that pays well, but it just pays the rent and doesn't really pay them emotionally and spiritually. So that's really important, and I've had the, the privilege of being able to do that in my life. Um, so I started uh, this journey with raw food when I went to study with Dr. Ann Wigmore in Puerto Rico in 1991. And I saw the extraordinary benefits of adding more raw vegan diet, um, raw vegan foods to, um, to my diet. And because even though I was healthy, um, I felt so much better when I stopped eating the cooked foods that I was eating, which included some foods cooked in oil and some of the other kinds of cooked foods that we're going to talk about that are not so good for you. So when I made that switch, it was quite astonishing. And um, that the one thing that was missing from the Ann Wigmore program was, the, was taste <laughs> and texture and appearance. <laughs> you know, the way food looks is important. And the way it tastes is really important. If food doesn't taste good, you're not going to eat it, right? I mean, you'd have to be dying. And you know, people were going there who were dying, so they ate that way while they were there. But then they got well, and they went home, and they went back to their old ways, and they got sick again. So that's why I made it my mission to make the food taste great. And, um, and I've never looked back, and I'm really so grateful that I've had the opportunity to teach thousands of people from over 60 countries who have come to our school. And, um, and that's where we're at, we're at now. So I'm going to let you, or ask you to tell them, <laughs> not let you. Okay. I, I'm going to let you get a word in edgewise, Dad. I'm going to get a chance to speak for a minute. <laughs> well, I was, compared to Sherry, I was a late bloomer. I, I, went, I grew up in Ohio, meat and potatoes territory. So for 42 years, I was a dedicated carnivore. And I you know, didn't know any better. I was in Silicon Valley. I was in the high tech industry. I was a pioneer in the Unix and internet world back in the late 70s and early 80s when it was, 
both of them were just being being formed and we had a number of startup companies and I thought I was living the, the really good life. I had a nice house in Los Altos, a bright red sports car, I was eating too much, drinking too much and one day I actually went to a talk on, on raw foods in about, about 95 and something just kind of clicked and it made sense and started trying it and started feeling better and then I realized that I had um, chronic, my aller I had chronic allergies, I had chronic back problems, I, I couldn't walk. When I first met Sherry, she had to carry our luggage because I couldn't carry it. Um, Not because you were weak, because your back hurt. My back hurt. And <laughs> I, I just couldn't lift anything, you know, anything up. I'd walk off a curb and it'd hurt. And I loved you know, him anyway. I was about, <laughs> about 35 pounds, you know, overweight, 40, almost 40 pounds over where I am today. And then I learned But he had potential. <laughs> she, she saw the potential, which was good. But I had actually started, you know, I was on my raw path for, for a while before I met Sherry. And in 98, I went to Hippocrates and I learned about uh, their health educator program. And I saw kind of what Sherry said when she saw it once at Dr. Ann Wigmore's is people had miraculous healing because when they changed their diet and ate better food, quit eating the stuff that was, was causing damage, amazing things happened. And I got so excited about that that I decided I didn't want to go back to high tech. And so I started a nonprofit called the Institute for Vibrant Living and we started putting on events in, in the South San Francisco in Silicon Valley. Lucy and was there. Yeah, Lucy Hi, was Lucy. following <laughs> us along for a long time. One of the early people in our, our community, a number of people around today. Um, and it was really great. We were bringing in great speakers from all over the world, hosting events and potlucks. And I was lucky enough, one of the events we did is we did a, a we were going to create a, uh, a dinner that was one of our first fundraising dinners and we brought Sherry's group from Living Light down and she created a class in Elegant Entertaining and they made all this food and that became the base for our first fundraising dinner and that's where I met Sherry and I was the MC for the evening so at the end of the evening I had to come out and give her some flowers and <laughs> and we caught it on video. We found out. We found out about four years later. Or at my mom's, we're showing Sherry's promotional video, and there was our first kiss. Oh. <laughs> it took us it took us years to, to go from friendship into a relationship, but it was really great. And so she's the the culinary, and I have all the technology, which is really great because you know in this day and age, the way we get to sixty countries, people knowing about where we are is through the internet and through through the web, but. Once now, I've been on raw foods for about 20 years. I don't have allergies anymore. My back problems are gone. We just took up running three years ago. And a couple weeks ago, we did our first half marathon. You won second place. I won second place in my First age. half marathon. Sherry got third yeah. in her age group. Today, today we got up this morning and went out. We stayed here and went ran down to the ocean and along the Great Highway and back and through Golden Gate Park and it was just gorgeous. So, it's it's never too late to start getting younger. And I feel every year it just feels younger and younger. So, it's really great. It's been quite a quite a transformation and it just keeps getting better. And it's part of as we're going to talk about. It's what we eat. And it's also what we don't eat and the rest of the things that involve a healthy lifestyle. And one of those, of course, does include exercise. Yes. And uh, it's true. We, we didn't start running until three years ago. And it's just kind of a quick, funny story. And that is that some of our employees were going to be running in this 10K race, which was local. And they said, well, why don't you guys run with us? And we weren't runners. And the race was in like 10 days. And so we said, yeah, sure, you know. <laughs> and so we started running. We probably ran four times before, because the first few times we ran, we could only run for, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe a, a mile. <laughs> <laughs> a mile, maybe, and we were sore the next day. Um, but And we never did run the whole 10K in those four days that we ran, but we did it and really literally couldn't walk for a, a days after that 10K. 
but we decided well we're going to keep doing this because this is a really good thing to do as you get older and you know we travel a lot and one of the problems that we we, we find is when we're traveling is it's hard to keep up on an exercise regi regime you know you have to find a gym and you know or a <laughs> zumba class or a yoga class or whatever when you run you just you know walk outside your hotel and start running so uh so we've managed to keep doing it and uh, it, it's it's been really great and as Dan says it's never too late to get younger it's never too late to start doing something that you thought you never could do when I was in my 30s before I went raw um, I couldn't run at all because my knees would bother me so much and a lot of people tell me I can't run because my knees hurt but <clears throat> if you have an alkaline diet you really focus on alkalinity and you you um, you're getting the nutrients that you need those kinds of problems can go away they went away from me and I, I, when I used to go I used to try to go hiking with my friends would go camping in Yosemite and go, go for a short hike I used to have to walk backwards down the hill because my knees hurt so bad anybody ever experienced that and now no problems yeah whatsoever yeah so so, so today in our talk, of, is vegan enough uh, to ensure good health? As I mentioned before, for those of you who weren't here, we are going to talk about <coughs> some of the important things that, that, that we believe in, in our studies and also our nutritional science program at Living Light um, <coughs> tells us that it's not only important what to eat, but it's also important what not to eat. And we have also learned through experience and um, a lot of it through experience, but also through research, a lot of other uh, health and, and uh, lifestyle modalities that are also important to include. So let's start with what to eat. <coughs> um, you know that we are proponents of, of, of eating fresh, ripe, raw, organic foods as much as possible. That doesn't mean that we exclude cooked foods because we do eat cooked foods. So we're going to talk about that as well. But let's talk first about whether they're cooked or raw, what foods are important for you to eat if, you're, if you are eating a plant-based diet. And the first thing is, is let's go to a plant-based diet. Let's get rid of all those animal products because as we know from the research that Dr. T. Colin Campbell has done and many other great minds uh, have found is that the animal-based products are really causing a lot of health problems and you know that we have a health crisis not just in the US but every country that we go to that has embraced the Western style of eating is having those same problems and some of them have happened in one generation I think when we went to was it Fiji it might have been Fiji and what our dive instructor was telling us and he was you know pretty rotund he was a dive instructor and he said that, and he was young, he was in his uh, 30s, maybe late 30s, and he said that, that just his generation, before his generation, people had great teeth, they, they had good health, they didn't have arthritis, they didn't have diabetes, and now his generation have all of that. And we've seen it happen more slowly, and so we kind of think it's normal, but it may be normal because that's what's happening, but it's not necessary and it's not natural. If we were eating the foods that nature intended us for us to eat, then it, this wouldn't be happening. So we suggest getting rid of the animal products and embracing more plant-based foods. And you're going to hear that, of course, oh, you know, everywhere in this festival. So we're kind of speaking to the choir. If you weren't here, you wouldn't already know some of that but there's still more to it than that so because we've been I've been going to vegetarian and vegan festivals for 25 years maybe and I've grown up with some of the leaders <coughs> of <coughs> this movement and a lot of them um, <coughs> I'm sad to say have not aged well and the reason is is that they didn't make the shift to the vegan lifestyle because they wanted to increase their health they made the shift because of compassion for animals and that's wonderful and I think everybody who embraces this way uh, of eating the plant-based lifestyle um, comes to that point whether they start as a result of wanting to be healthy or they do it you know because they are compassionate to animals um, if you start this way of life because you want to uh, to to be healthier to lose weight 
or, or you know any of that, then you're going to stop, your heart is going to stop being hardened to the suffering of the animals because you don't have to harden it in order to eat the flesh. You start to see what it is you're eating and recognize that and you just become more compassionate anyway. But people who are stay just focused on the compassion part of it oftentimes don't give themselves that same generosity of spirit. They don't take care of their bodies and nurture their bodies and give their bodies what it needs. And so they continue to eat you know, fake meat, fried foods, uh, junk foods out of packages, and not eat enough fresh, lively foods that can really fuel the body and, and nourish it in, in the way that it needs to. And these fried foods, for example, um, create acrylamides, uh, many of them create acrylamides and other cancer-causing chemicals as a result of high heat cooking, particularly if they're starches and fats. And they're not eating the fresh, lively foods that contain the nutrients that they need. And, and those nutrients is, we've all heard that broccoli is good for us, cauliflower, all those things are good. That's because there's phytonutrients that are in these plants. The plants have natural protection that's there to protect them from being sunburned, because if they didn't have protection, they're out in the sun, they just, everything would burn and fry, and from, from bugs and from disease. And we get to take advantage of all those phytonutrients when the plants come to us because those are still there. And if you read any of the research, you'll see different research about all the different components. We, uh, we have a, a subscription, we watch Dr. Greger. I don't know how many Anybody here do that? Yeah. Uh, okay. You see that the, each, each day he has something special and it's about a particular thing, a research, one little component in a plant that they show how that component can save you know, a couple years off your life. And he put them together and he's got five years or so of these things where each component could save you a couple years. So when you put all these components together in a holistic and a synergistic package, which is what Whole Foods gives us, because they're not little chemicals extracted, that's where we get our maximum type of nutrition. And the one thing that's not in a lot of his literature and a lot of literature in general is the fact that these phytonutrients, most of them are very susceptible to heat. And so that when you start cooking things, the phytonutrients start being destroyed and diminished in their power. And that's why raw food is like supercharged. So you take, a, you take your fruits and vegetables that are already good for you, but you leave them with the maximum potential that your body can get. Now there are a few exceptions, so well I heard that tomatoes have lycopene and if you don't cook it you won't get the lycopene. That's true. There's about two exceptions to the whole rule. Tomatoes is one, but if you break the cell walls of tomato, like it's blended or you food process it, then you get the lycopene. The other thing you get is things like raspberries and watermelon have more lycopene than the, than the tomatoes did in the first place. And typically what happens is people say, well I've got to cook my tomatoes, so what do you do? You cook a tomato, you put it on some pizza, you put it on some you know, wheat bread, you put a little bit of cheese on top, or even if it's vegan cheese, and now to get this little bit of extra nutrient out of your tomatoes, you've killed off the rest of the nutrients in the tomatoes and you take another bunch of food that's not so good for you in. So people go the long, wrong way. Another exception is broccoli. Broccoli, if you lightly steam broccoli a little bit, it'll release a little bit more. And Quite of frankly, cancer, of cancer, cancer fighting food. chemicals. And quite frankly, it actually tastes a little bit better. So all you actually have to do is just pour boiling water over it. You don't have to cook it. You don't have to put it in boiling water and steam it because as soon as you cook it too much, now you've lost everything so, or, or almost everything. So there's a couple exceptions, but that's it. So by eating the, the whole foods as minimally processed as possible, you're going to really supercharge. And the other thing that's important about these phytonutrients is they tend to align with the colors of the produce. Different things, reds have a certain, like lycopene, different things, blues, purples, yellows, they all have different spectrums of vitamins. So if you want to get your whole spectrum of phytonutrients, what you do is you eat the colors of the rainbow. So you want to have colorful food. So having a little bit of that, but one of the key foundations is green. 
So that's our favorite color. Green, green is so good in many ways. It's good for the environment, it's good for the plants, it looks good, and eating greens are really good. And High in protein, high in calcium, high in phytonutrients and antioxidants, omega-3 fatty acids, and we need all of those. You know, they're all important to us. Yes. So, yeah, green is important, and as Dan said, all the colors of the rainbow are important. And what happens if we overcook vegetables? They lose their color, don't they? If you are going to cook vegetables, and you know, we do, we, we steam um, sweet potatoes, we like steamed sweet potatoes, and so do our dogs. We make our dogs' foods. Um, we also cook legumes. We love split peas, and we love uh, um, beans of different kinds, and uh, lentils, so we do that and we also steam quinoa um, but the majority of our food are vegetables and fruits that are uncooked and these other foods supplement our our diet and provide us with you know some just variety and warmth in the winter or we live on the coast so it could even be cool in the in the summertime um, so having a variety of, of different kinds of foods is important and we certainly don't want to think of this as a religion and dogmatic like oh if you eat that you're gonna die you know you, you gotta have some balance in your life and you have to have some opportunity to make choices when you go out to a restaurant uh, you can't you know always get exactly the kind of food that you want but we do try to make uh, our choices where we eat good choices and we try to eat organic because, and if th for those of you who don't know, there is a wonderful group called the Environmental Working Group. I know that a lot of you know that group, it's, and you can go to their website, ewg.org. That stands for Environmental Working Group, ewg.org. And they'll tell you the foods to stay away from that are really toxic and not so good for you, the dirty dozen. Um, and then they'll also tell you the foods that if you can't afford to eat organic all the time or all your foods organic, these are foods that are really low in pesticides and they are not doing a lot of, uh, what they do to them doesn't do a lot of harm to the planet or to you. For example, avocados. I grew up in Santa Barbara, California. We had 75 avocado trees. We never fertilized, we never sprayed. Avocado, have you ever found a bug in an avocado? They have no natural enemies. Now at Living Light, because we make a commitment to our students, we buy all organic, including organic avocados. But I can tell you in our personal life, when we go to the grocery store, I always check out the price of both, organic and conventional. And look at the quality of both. And sometimes we buy conventional. Um, because we know there's no problem with that. So you need to know about this site because they do change from time to time. Uh, and tell you, well, now we can take this one off the dirty dozen list because they, they're not doing that anymore. Or we have to add this to the dirty dozen list because now they're using a new chemical that hasn't been tested. So, uh, so organic is really important. We really believe strongly in organic, uh, not just for our own health, but also for the health of the planet. And all those creatures of the earth that are so important for our, to, to make this life for all of us sustainable. Look what's happening to the bees today. Um, you know, if we lose our bees, what's going to happen to us? So we really have to be aware of all this. We can't just hide our head in the sand and think everything is okay. We really, uh, you know, we don't want to be defeatists, that's for sure. But one of the things that we can do and feel really empowered by is making good choices and knowing that every time we spend money, we're making, we're voting for something and we're helping to uh, we're helping the company that we're supporting through our dollars to thrive and do we want you know Procter and Gamble to thrive you know so we want to choose the companies that we invest in and we invest every time we spend money um, we want to do that consciously it's, it, there's a consciousness around this whole lifestyle and it makes you feel good so that you don't feel like a defeatist it's empowering yes. And another key thing about organic, if it's organic, then it's GMO free. And right. GMOs are such, we're just a big experiment. You know, nobody knows what the long-term impact is. And there are studies that show there's short-term impact, but long-term as we, as we lose the ability to get real food and the, and the battles that the, the industry has to just 
not have to disclose to us what's GMO. You know, it's like that's pretty pretty sad that they're so afraid that if we were empowered to know what was by labeling laws what was GMO, we'd make different choices. So right. you have to be, you just have to become aware and educate yourself. And basically, anything that's corn, anything that's soy, you know, almost most wheat, and now you know, sugar beets, you know, all sorts, almost all GMO now. It's really quite And it's hard sad. to be an organic farmer because, you know, but let's not go there too much. So that's not, but just, because that's yeah, a whole nother talk. Yeah. <laughs> there are people that spend their whole lives just dealing with that. Oh yeah, so, oh yeah. But, but we do want to mention it. Yes, yeah, because it is important. So, so eating a plant-based diet, including all the colors of the rainbow in, in your diet, having as much fresh, ripe, raw, organic foods as possible. And when you do have cooked foods, water cook your food. So that when I say water cook, I'm talking about steaming, boiling, braising, not broiling, frying, baking, or roasting, because those are high heat methods of cooking that cause the, cr the creation of these chemicals that are carcinogenic, like acrylamides, and destroying some of the nutrients that if you just steamed the food lightly, you would at least be able to maintain a lot of the nutrients. For example, spinach. If you just lightly steam spinach for a minute, you, you, you might still be able to keep 70, 50 to 75 percent of the folate. And you'll eat a lot more spinach because look what happens to it. It goes like this, right? Even just for a minute you steam it. So you're probably getting, still getting more. But if you, if you steam it for five minutes, the folate's gone. And doesn't matter how much you eat, you're not going to get any. So lightly steam, and when it comes to things like legumes, we like to let them sprout first before we cook them, and that makes them more digestible. I'm not one that can really digest just sprouted raw legumes. They just don't, they take too long for me to digest. I want to go out for a run an hour after I eat. So I can cook them once they're sprouted and they're easy to digest. So see for yourself, start to pay attention to how you feel. Really important to know how you feel because we're all different. And we come from different backgrounds and we're on a different place in our journey. I'm finding that there are some foods I didn't used to be able to eat that I can eat now and some foods that I used to think were okay for me but now I'm finding that they make me feel heavier. I don't think it's so much that I'm aging because I'm not. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> but I think that it is that I'm becoming more and more aware of my body and how foods impact me. And so that's, and that you just have to, you know, maybe start by journaling so that you really start to get aware of what it is that you're eating. And some of the, some of the things before we move on to some of the things that you don't want to eat, besides eating all the colors of the rainbow, you do want to make sure um, that you're getting omega-3 fatty acids. That's really important. Um, and you can find those. I mentioned that they're in dark leafy greens. You have to eat a lot of dark leafy greens to get enough omega-3 fatty acids, but it's one good source. Another good source is some nuts. Yesterday, some of you were in my class and I made um, a chocolate cake using walnuts. Walnuts are a great source of omega-3 fatty acids. Flax seed, even better. Chia, even better than that. So you can utilize those, put them in your smoothies, put them in your crackers if you're making raw crackers. Um, so get the omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, not, not, you can use flax oil, but just use a small amount because oils are really not the best source of omega-3 fatty acids. And you might actually get too much of it because you're not designed to eat oil. And you'll get, you know, sometimes you get too much of something when you're eating something that's that concentrated. So um, you also want to make sure you're getting B12. I know some people have probably already told you that, and the vegan, uh, vegan researchers are finding that we all need B B12. Uh, if we're not eating any animal products at all. And even, you know, it's actually becoming quite, um, quite prevalent for non-plant eaters to also have a problem with B12 because the soil is so depleted that the organism that lives in the soil that we get to eat when we eat our food is no longer there. 
the soil is just that depleted and so a lot of non-plant eaters are also having a problem getting enough B12. So B12 is not difficult. You can get a vegan source of B12. Another nutrient that we highly recommend you take unless you're living in an area with lots of sun and this isn't one of those, <laughs> then you should be taking uh, vitamin D. D is so important. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's, you know, I would say it's as important as vitamin C. You need to have plenty of vitamin C. You can get that with food. V vitamin D, you can't get with food. I mean, unless you're drinking vitamin D fortified milk, and what that is is vitamin D vitamins added to. And so you want to, you, you do need to have some kind of a supplement for that, and that you can get also in a vegan formula. Um, probiotics really important because so many of us maybe drink tap water or we're just under a lot of stress maybe we've had um, antibiotic therapy or some other kind of medication so making sure that you're getting some form of probiotics we 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 make sauerkraut you know cost pennies a serving so easy to make you know you shred the shred the cabbage massage it with some salt let it sit in your in your pantry for three days and you've got it fresh probiotics if you don't want to go that far, then you know take some pills. <laughs> That's not so hard. And buy sauerkraut or buy kefir. Buy There's sauerkraut. Some people with some wonderful kefirs here. At That's the, right. Uh, and kvass. Yeah, so those kvass. are all. Um, so include probiotics in your daily lifestyle. That's and, also important. And lots of liquids. Stay well hydrated. Mm -hmm. you know, making sure that you're you're having a lot of liquid in your diet. Good. Reach for your water. Reach for your <laughs> coconut water. Really a, a great thing to uh, fortify yourself with. And the other thing about unprocessed fruits and vegetables, they're all very high in water content. So when we're eating a, a high uh, raw plant-based diet, you're also going to get a lot of water in its nutrient-rich state through juices, um, teas, <laughs> anything where you're getting lots of liquids. It's really important for the body to, to process. And when we're having lots of water, a lot of times when you think you're hungry, all you do is drink of water. You know, so have your water nearby. Don't just, you know, typically if you think you're thirsty, if you've waited to where your, your mouth's parched, like, I'm feeling like that right now, is uh, it's a little too late. You should have been drinking water before then. So making sure you get lots of liquid and once you get on a high you know, fruit and vegetable diet, you're gonna get a natural source of a lot of that. We love the green juices. You know, we have a smoothie in the morning that's a green smoothie with all the colors of the rainbow. So we have strawberries and blueberries and, and something yellow, peaches or, or, Mango. or mangoes, and then a lot of greens. And that's, our, that's how we start our day. Then we have green juice, so more green. So the, really important, as we said, greens green's one of our favorite colors. You mix your vegetables and fruits in a smoothie? Actually, um, let, uh, greens, leafy greens, are not vegetables, they're leaves. And leaves go with everything. So I I if you look at food combining, if you're really focused, and by the way, I just want to say one thing about food combining. Food combining is not a, a, a science that's been researched but it is something that I'm not saying it doesn't matter because each of you will know how uh, how it affects your body when you combine different foods together but people who do teach uh, 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 food combining like Dr. Doug Graham and a lot of other um, hi natural hygienists will say that leaves are not the same as other kinds of vegetables and you can blend them with fruits Yep, no problem. You're, you're, that's, that's fine. You're welcome. So, um, so the foods that we've talked about, plant foods, uh, are are really important. We've talked about cooked foods. What foods? You know, how to cook your foods if you're going to choose to eat cooked foods and not to overcook them. Um, and then let's talk about also the foods that you want to avoid. Um, and one of the some people think if you're on a plant-based diet, and you know, there's some seats right over here. If anybody wants to sit there, don't worry about disturbing us, you won't be. Um, so the, um, the foods that you want to avoid, uh, I mentioned already oil. Um, 
we have some raw oils in our salad dressings, but we also try to use more whole food fats in salad dressings, uh, including maybe a cashew milk at, for, as a base for making a, a ranch dressing, or a little bit of avocado just to thicken a dressing a little bit so it clings to the leaves nicely. Um, and, but oils, if you're going to use oils, oils, using them that way in small amounts is the preferable way to do it. Cooking food in oil is, the pro is, is problematic because all oils have a threshold of heat that once you get past their threshold, and some of them have a much lower threshold than others. Coconut oil has a much higher threshold, for example, than olive oil. Flax oil has a really low threshold. And you don't just destroy some of the nutrients, you actually create um, carcinogenic uh, chemicals when you cook oil. So you want to stay away from cooked oil. So that's fried foods, that's all the chips and all those packaged, you know, fast food things. Um, some of them will say baked, but they're still, if you look at the ingredients, there's oil in them. And so even though they weren't fried, they were baked, you think you're safe because they were baked, you're not because those oils were still baked at higher temperature than their threshold. And, uh, and so you, you really want to stay away from cooked oils. Now that's going to mean nuts and seeds that are roasted, those, even though they weren't cooked in oil, they have fat in them. And so those oils also become uh, problematic for you. They're aging, they cause something called free radicals. Um, and those free radicals destroy your cells. And that is aging as well as can make you ill. And so when people look at me and they think, wow, you look so young for 68, but I'm not eating all that stuff. I'm not eating fried foods that cause the acrylamides and everything else to cause aging. And I'm getting more vitamin C that helps to build collagen so I have nice skin. And that doesn't mean I'm not, you know, getting wrinkles. I am, but I'm not, you know, looking like I would be if I were eating these foods that are, you know, aging and, and make you sick. So it's not, there's, you know, it's, it's no secret and you don't have to be special to, to do this, to stay young and healthy and fit as you get older chronologically. So stay away from those kinds of fast foods, especially that have, um, that are packaged and, you know, that you're, you don't have kind of control over. Um, I would rather not eat than eat that stuff because to me it's just not food. And you get to that point where you don't look at it as food anymore so you're really not even tempted by it. And another big one is gluten. You know, everybody, you know, there's a big gluten-free craze, right? But, well, it's because it's really important. Gluten causes a lot of, of challenges. Some people are celiac, which is completely gluten intolerant, so they can't have anything at all. But the rest of us tend to be gluten sensitive to one level or another. And that's where our, our achy joints, stiffness comes from. I had that in my 30s. Yeah. I had, I had achy joints in my 30s. I thought, oh, I'm going to get arthritis like the rest of my family. And then yeah. when I cut out, well, I cooked, first cut out cooked food, and then um, I, it went away. And then when I started eating bread again, I'd notice it. Like if I ate bread two or three days in a row, I'd start to get achy joints again. Finally connected it and stopped eating pasta and bread altogether. And I'm sure that was part of my challenges with my knees and everything else. It all builds up, gluten and, and stiffness and aging and Well, it's and very arthritis. acidic, but very acidic. The, the other side of that is just because it says gluten-free <laughs> doesn't mean it's good for you. You gotta start watching those labels because most of those gluten-frees are a lot of the same t process with oils and, and fried and chemicals and other things that are just as damaging, they just don't have the gluten component. And they don't have the nutrients that you want. If you're going to put something in your mouth, make it so that it's going to nourish your body. You know, it's not going to take away, it's not going to like be filler so you don't have room for something that's good for you. Yeah, so, so gluten-free is important, but just watch those choices because just as you can be a, a junk food vegan, you can be a junk food gluten-free vegan just as easy. <laughs> and in Maybe fact, even easier because they got big labels. They got yellow labels wherever you go in the store. You think it's healthy, so right? 
before you reach for that, make sure you watch the ingredients. And if it's got ingredients that you can't pronounce, <laughs> stay away. Yeah, we went. We were. We did a world tour, and we came out with our last book, uh, Raw Food for Smart Busy People. Uh, we call it. The yeah. That's what we call raw food for dummies. They, for some reason, the dummies series wants to call it dummies. You know, that was part of our requirement to write a book with them. Is they want to call it dummies, and we actually resisted for a long time because people that want to eat this way aren't dummies. No. They're smart. Yeah. You know, but we finally realized that there's a lot of people that relate to the dummy series, so it'd probably be a good thing to say. Since for years they wanted us to write the book, we we finally agreed and. We came out for raw food for dummies. But. Yeah, and when we, we went on a world tour and we went to all these different festivals and uh, it was just shocking to us. There are not a lot of raw food festivals, but there are a lot of vegetarian festivals around the world. And uh, it was really shocking to us because so many of them, there was nothing there for us to eat. <laughs> Once in a while there would be somebody that had a salad and it was like this big. Or somebody else had a fruit stand. Yeah, right, fruit a fruit stand. Smoothie. But most things were fried or had a lot of oil and they were really cooked to death and we just, you know, had to go to find a place early in the morning that could, you know, get salads and we'd just be eating like a head of romaine lettuce and <laughs> munching on a cucumber or something. Get some hummus <laughs> and some avocados. Yeah. And, you know, pack our, yeah. Pack our lunches. So when, when you say junk food vegan, it's really true. You can be a junk food vegan and you can be accelerating your aging um, just as easily, almost as easily maybe, as a regular standard American diet. But there are some other things. We've been talking about food a lot. Um, have we missed any of the food stuff before we move on? Because there's the some other lifestyle choices that are really important. And we've already talked about the fact that we, we, we're runners. Um, and, and it's really important to find something that you like. Do you like to dance? Well, just going out on a weekend and dancing isn't enough. Go to a Zumba class or do, do something that you're, you know, you're exercising on a daily basis. Walk. Don't park, you know, we find ourselves doing this too, it's so silly. You know, because we, we you know, we'll run 12 miles and we don't think about parking cl as close as we can so that we don't have to walk before we start running. But we do that when we go to the grocery store. What's that about? Everybody you know? look for the closest parking spot when they go to the grocery store? <laughs> yep. You know, just... Little exercise. Keep your car away from everybody else and walk a little bit. Yeah, walk up the stairs when you can instead of taking the elevator or the escalator. Make sure that you get some weight-bearing exercise I'm, and I'm talking about walking running weightlifting something that helps to build your bones um, I took a I've, I've taken a couple of really heavy falls because we like to run on trails and sometimes you know I'm looking at my pace because I like to run fast looking at my pace to make sure I'm keeping up and take my oh, eyes off the tree root yeah it just like you know appeared in front of me <laughs> before I saw it and so Bam! I hit hard and you know I'm a vegan woman and I didn't break anything <laughs> you know so you've got to get that weight bearing exercise to make sure that you have strong bones and as you age you you, you know you have to see it becomes even more important to do that so uh, so weight bearing exercise but just find something that makes you fall in love with exercise whatever that means got to do it um, and then you need to make sure you're getting plenty of fresh air and I know that's hard when you live in a city although thank God San Francisco has those nice winds don't complain about those winds <laughs> because that really helps to refresh your air it's really really important you've got to deep breathe deeply get some aerobic activity and and make sure that it's not behind a bus <laughs> so, you're getting got some really good fresh air because that's detoxifying really important and Dan already mentioned um, uh, how important it is to get plenty of water you can't think straight your your body can't function properly uh, if you're not getting enough if you're not if you're under hydrated and um, that doesn't mean that you want to drink soda pop all day because you don't want to eat a lot of sugar because sugar also uh, there are a lot of diseases that thrive on sugar a lot of the cancer clinics take people off sugar and that even means some of the sugars that are natural sugars 
So if you want to stay healthy, limit the amount of sugar intake as well as the amount of oil intake. I don't say fat intake. You notice I say oil intake because I do believe that good whole food fats are important. Doesn't mean you want to eat, you know, three avocados a day, but an avocado a day is that's good healthy fat. A handful, small handful of nuts a day, that's good healthy fat, but they're not roasted, right? So make sure that you, you, you stay balanced with these foods. And weight management, one of the nice things about eating a, a diet that's high in raw plant-based food is it creates a natural weight you know, platform because as you're getting the proper nutrients in, a couple of things happen. One is when you get nutrients, the body says, I'm not hungry anymore. You can eat potato chips all day and the body still says, I'm hungry. That's why they said you can't eat just one, right? That, that <laughs> commercial. But it's because you can't, because it's not satisfying. Your body knows when it's gotten nutrition and you know, that doesn't happen. And the other area that the body says you've had enough nutrition is when your stomach stretches enough. There's little stress receptors that say, oh, I'm full. I can stop eating. And that's when you should stop eating. And Typically, it's a little slow because typically by the time you feel you're full, you're probably overeating a little bit because we tend to eat too fast. And Speak for you, yourself, Dan. Oh, yeah. Particularly me. Guilty. Chew, chew, guilty? chew, 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 chew. Um, but when we're eating a, a plant-based diet of, of unprocessed foods, is it takes quite a little bit, right? You know, it's a, We love salads, but we have a great big salad, and that's very filling. And it's filling both from the nutrition standpoint and from the volume and from the high water content so the body gets satiated sooner if you're eating processed cooked food that's you know all compacted in you can eat too many calories really easily and all it takes is a few extra you know, calories every day and you know in 5 10 20 years it just sneaks up a little you know an ounce at a time every day you know how much do you get in a year yeah, and people think that's normal, which it probably is. As people get older, it's kind of normal for them to gain weight, but that doesn't mean it has to happen. Um, my brother, who is about 10 years younger than me, he says, well, you know, sis, I'm over the hill now. And, uh, and, and <laughs> got to go sometime. Yeah, and he says, well, you know, we can't all be like you, sis. I mean, yes, you can. You just have to make some different choices. That's all. You're not making the right choices. But, you know, you, you ha there comes a point where you really can't preach to people. Thank you for all being here and being interested because uh, it's unfortunate that we can't necessarily impact our family who we love and we would love to see them happy. They'd be a lot happier if they were healthy and if they were doing something with their lives that make them feel like, you know, they have value. Like when they die, they will have that feel like they lived for a purpose. And that's another one of the things that we feel is so important, is to choose a path in life that I even if you can't make it your life's work, that you're doing something with your life that you're passionate about and that you feel like that it's gonna make a difference, like you've been here for a reason. Uh, I find that people who have that, who have discovered that, are happier people. And because they're happy, they want to live longer. I mean, if you're not happy, what's the point, you know? People kind of just give up. Well, what's life about anyway? You know, nothing good ever happens to me. Um, but, you know, you can't just sit around and wait for something good to happen to you. So, um, so yeah, embrace your passion. And, and I think that it's also important to do so, to do things for other people or uh, or animals to have something where you really feel like you're you're stepping outside of yourself. It's not all about you. That you have your gener generosity, compassion. That you're able to express that, and um, and expressing love is important too. And that's like it's not necessarily the same, but it can it can be connected. But um, but it is an, also an important thing is to have uh, an, a, a, the ability to express love and to accept it as well. You know, there's this kind of circle of abundance. A lot of us who are givers feel really good about giving, but when other people want to give to us, we say, oh, no, no, that's okay. 
I mean, even, you know, you have guests that come over to your house for dinner and you spend all day making this beautiful food and then you serve them the food and they want to help you clean up and you say, no, no. <laughs> yes. Let them help you. It gives them joy to give back. And it keeps that circle of abundance flowing because if you don't let people give back to you, you are blocking the gift of giving. You, you know, and everybody needs to be able to do that, to give and receive is the other side of it. Giving and receiving. And that's the same with money. You know, a lot of people are good at giving, but then they think that they have to block the abundance side of it, the receiving side of it, because if they do, then it means they weren't giving from the heart. They were expecting something back. And that's not really true. You can give of yourself and still receive the benefit of it financially or through gifts or just through love and appreciation, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It's all the same. It's giving and receiving. And one that we didn't mention as we walked, went through some of this stuff is sleep. It's important to get enough rest. And one of the things, the way that fits also in with food is don't eat so late at night. Your body is, at night is when we're supposed to be regenerating. And our, so when our memories get, get stored away and, and different things happen, our body refreshes. And, and chemicals are created when you're sleeping. And one of the top priorities the body places on anything is digestion. So if you've just eaten food and you've eaten a heavy rich dinner, all your energy is right there for digesting. Anybody get tired after they eat a little bit too much? Well, that's the wrong kind of tire. That's just because your body's spending all this energy on digestion and not on regeneration. So it's important to eat light and eat early. So no, you know, midnight munching and then, you know, trying to go to bed. Your body, you'll wake up maybe, maybe at two, three o'clock. All of a sudden you're hot. You're trying to throw all the covers off because your body's got a digestive fire. It's busy trying to digest and not letting you do the regeneration. So watch what you eat late. Eat early. It's good to eat several hours, you know, three hours at least before you're going to bed and eat something lighter so that your body isn't working really hard and so you can regenerate and then you can wake up full of energy and ready to face the next day. And sleep, you'll be sleeping less because you won't be spending two hours digesting food while you're, you know, would be getting good deep sleep. So I found that I went from sleeping eight hours and waking up tired to sleeping six hours and waking up refreshed. So it makes a huge difference. And the other thing is alcohol. Dan and I live in wine country and we like to have a glass of wine with our dinner quite often. Um, but more than that, interrupts my sleep. So you just need to pay attention to your habits and see what makes you feel good when you wake up in the morning and what doesn't. And, and, and take responsibility for that. I, I don't know if you're doing a QA. and a I'd like to ask you about coffee. Okay. Is, is, if you have an all alkaline diet, is it appreciated? Mm -hmm. Also, what do you think of enemas, coffee enemas for people who've had a disease and also um, regressions? Okay, we've done all of that. Mm -hmm. And um, we like to have a cup of coffee now and then, but cof and coffee does actually have some health benefits, just like chocolate has some health benefits, but you don't want to depend on that to, be, to stay energized. So if you're going to drink coffee, I recommend you drink it by itself and have weak coffee, not strong coffee. Yeah, I know, I know. And Starbucks coffee, oh my God, I can't drink that. Mm -hmm. It just would make me climb the walls. You just need to pay attention to your body and see how much stimulation is really, you know, you can really handle. And that's the same thing with chocolate as well. And certain times of the day, you don't want to be stimulating your body because you're going to interfere with your sleep. As far as uh, enemas are concerned, when you're doing some kind of a cleanse where you're not eating any roughage at all so that your bowels are not moving, then enemas and colonics can be a good thing, in my opinion. And in my opinion, um, I don't have coffee enemas, but I have done it, but it's the same kind of thing. It goes into your system and it's very stimulating, so I wouldn't be doing that at night before I went to bed. 
um, wheatgrass implants. You know, I've done the Ann Wigmore program and the Hi Hippocrates program, Optimal and health that's program. all Optimal Health, and that's all a part of their cleansing and detoxification, and I've done all that. I think that once you get to a point in your life where you are making really good choices and you've done that kind of detox, it's not something that you have to continue to do because it's not... You know, you weren't born with an enema bag and wheatgrass juice. Um, we're designed really well, but with, sometimes we have to undo the damage that we've done, and those can be good tools to help you do that. If you have coffee that's shade-grown, organic, and aerated... Well, that would be what you'd want. That would be the ideal. I still wouldn't say that you want to have and drink and it all day. The planet, you know, shade-grown is better for the planet and maybe the people that are growing it, but it just doesn't make the... You still wouldn't have four cups a day. No! Wouldn't have, and I wouldn't be depending on it for energy when you could be having a green juice instead. Yeah. Let's just see if there's anything else really quickly. Can you um, talk about the food combining? Food combining. We mentioned yeah, it briefly. Kind of as, as, she, as Sherry said, one is there's no scientific research that supports food combining, but there's a lot of you know, people's own experience. So the most important thing about food combining is pay attention to what works for you. If you eat a couple things that combine that don't combine well, and you find yourself bloated, gassy, gassy you know, pay attention to that. Don't eat them together. You know, eat things eat things separately. It's typically one of the key things for food combining is eat the things first that are going to go through that are really high water content. So you wouldn't want to eat a bunch of beans and a heavy heavy meal, and then go have watermelon or something that's really sweet. You know, that's asking kind of for a disaster. Uh, but just pay it really the key is pay attention as we said like things like leafy greens they can go with everything so you know no matter what you're eating you can always have a salad have some kale you know those are going to be great and so there's going to be there's one more thing before I, I know that we're running out of time here we can answer more questions at our booth if you'd like to come to our booth but there's one more thing that we missed that I think is really important and that is stress particularly when you're eating don't be watching the news when you're eating. Unless you find the good news channel, and if you do, that doesn't exist. Tell the rest of the world because <laughs> you need one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so um, stress reduction is important. Meditation, yoga, these uh, walking on the beach, petting your dog, you know, whatever, expressing love. Um, those are all stress reducers. And so, as much as you can, reduce stress because stress is a killer, um, and particularly when you're eating. When you're eating, when you're preparing food, sattva, really important to prepare food with love and to put good energy into it. If you're feeling angry or resentful or upset, walk away from food. Don't prepare food for yourself or others. Uh, so that's it re really important. So stress reduction. And unfortunately, our time is up and there's another speaker that wants to come in. But before you go, I just have something to say here. We have those raffle tickets that we're going to collect them from you. Uh, if you have filled them out, if you don't have a raffle ticket, we have some. And Dan will go to the back, to those of you who don't have one. Um, we do have our books for sale at our booth. We're going to be giving away that free dehydrator at 3 o'clock. If you want to be at our booth at 3 o'clock, that's when we're going to draw for the free Excalibur dehydrator. If you're not there and your name is called, you're going to have to pay to have it shipped. So if you're here, come in. And, and if you have any more questions, do contact us at our booth. We're happy to talk to you about that. Thank you very much. Thank you.